Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining in. This is Dr. Sam Omar with yet another video of how to use R2Gate. Today my topic is going to be the R2Gate theory, protocols and application. Let me uh, go ahead and start by giving you just a brief introduction about R2Gate. R2Gate software has been there since 2012 and uh, the way R2Gate software really started was you know, using it as a software to match the models to the CBCT and that was pretty much it. By time we started to develop more and more with the R2Gate software and it started to transform into an implant planning software. But now the software has seen much more advancements and R2Gate became a complete and a fully developed full treatment planning software and by full treatment planning software we mean everything that you as a clinician might need to treatment plan a full mouth rehabilitation case whether it was you know, doing a cephalometric analysis uh, uh, doing an assessment of the skeletal relationship of the patient, uh, opening a vertical of the patient, establishing a new occlusal plane, doing a smile design, doing implant planning, really everything now you could do with the software. But now I really need to focus with this video on certain things and I'll focus more today on using R2Gate as a treatment planning software for implants mainly. So let's just go ahead and focus on that today. And uh, the reason why uh, I would like to uh, focus on this topic is because I think there's really a lot of information that people might need to receive in order for them to utilize this software to the fullest. Uh, today, again, my topic is R2Gate theory, protocols, and application. This is me. My name is Dr. Sam Omar. I'm a general dentist with a private practice in Cairo, Egypt, exclusive to implantology and restorative dentistry. I'm also a resident of the prosthetics department in Cairo University, uh, also a member of the R2Gate Digital Center's development and education team, an R2Gate and R2 Digital Oral Design Trainer, international lecturer and speaker on digital implantology, guided surgery, and one-day implants protocol. I'm also an active member of the Digital Dentistry Society EDF. This is my email, and please, if you have any questions, just go ahead and write me uh, an email be more than happy to answer your questions so for our topic today the content is going to be as follows I'm going to cover uh, you know a few issues and I'm going to cover these few topics and hopefully we'll make sure that we cover all the questions that you guys have you know previously sent me so the first thing we'll cover is the one day implants concept <clears throat> and also we'll cover the data collection and validation. How do you gather the right information and how do you confirm that this is the actual, you know, actually the information that you really need? Uh, we'll talk about the partially versus fully edentulous protocols. We'll talk about overcoming challenges of fully guided surgery, art to gate surgical kits components in usage, and understanding the art to report and drilling sequence. These are the six topics I'm going to cover in my presentation today. And I always like to start with this question. If you have such a case, would you consider doing guided surgery for this case right here? As you can see here, it looks like we have plenty of bone. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all the experienced surgeons out there, all the experienced clinicians will say, you know, Sam, I've been placing implants for quite a few years now, I've been placing implants for 20 years, 15 years, 25 years, and I really don't need a guide. I'm in a stage right now where I don't really need a guide. And what I'll say to you is actually you're absolutely correct. You do not need a guide to do surgery in this case because surgery here is going to be quite easy. But let me try and change your mind. Sometimes we get cases like this where we do have a good a wide bridge, an abundant amount of keratinized mucosa, and it looks like you know we do have a good amount of bone as well in the CBCT. And again, the experienced clinicians will say, you know, this is a very nice case and it's an easy case to freehand. But I want you to take a look at this picture. Right here, this is a prefabricated crown, which means I've designed and manufactured this crown before the surgery. Remember, patients want teeth, not implants. So your patient will really appreciate if you can give them the teeth in the same day when you place 
your implants as well. So this prefabricated crown can only, only fit in one position. So essentially what I'm doing with my surgical guide is I'm trying to place the implant in a position where this prefabricated crown will fit. So if you think about it, I'm not really doing guided surgery, I'm more doing guided prosthetics. And this is really going to be the essence of our topic today. So let me remind you that actually most of the advances in dentistry for the past five decades have been for the sole purpose of only three things. Number one would be reducing time, reducing cost, and then increasing the quality. So basically all the advances and all the technology that we've been doing has essentially been focusing on these three things, which you know in turn leads to the increase in profitability. So reducing time, reducing cost, and increasing quality has really led to the rise of the one-day implants concept. Really, we're trying to cut down the time of treatment and to minimize and shorten the time of treatment as much as possible. So, so many people have been doing the one-day implants concept. We just call it in different names. Some people call it same-day teeth, new teeth in a day, new teeth in one day. These are just different you know, names to essentially the same thing, which is, you know, my patients, you know, come to the office and in the same day, they just receive a new set of teeth. But there is always, always the best way to do something. So what would be the best way to do one day implants? And what would be the most efficient way to do one day implants? Ideally, the process of one day implants should be a process where we place and restore the implants in the same day, going fully digital. Number two, all planning and manufacturing of prosthetics should be done before the surgery and not after the surgery. The reason why is to minimize the chair time. Remember, the most expensive asset is time. And chair time especially is very expensive. So what we want to do is we want to manufacture the prosthetics before the surgery and not after the surgery. It's a process that requires very careful treatment planning with consideration of all aspects of treatment. And today, our key point is treatment planning. We'll talk a little bit more about this. Treatment planning for one-day implants. Well, the process of positioning the implant in an ideal position based on the current circumstances, restorative position, and availability of bone and soft tissue. So this is essentially what treatment planning means. Treatment planning means we're trying to find what the best implant position is going to be. You know, regardless of what type of implant planning software, these are essentially the two main things you will need, the CBCT and the model scan. But what are the criteria of the CBCT scan you're going to be using? And this is what we're going to, you know, pay a little bit more attention to. Do all CBCT scans work? And the answer is no. We actually have certain criteria that we need to check in a CBCT for us to actually be able to use this CBCT. Number one will be acquisition date, FOV, motion artifacts, metal scatter, and beam hardening. Essentially, these are the five things that we need to check before going on and, and using a CBCT for the process of treatment planning uh, and implant. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about each and every one of those five criteria for the CBCT. Number one will be the acquisition date. It is recommended that the CBCT used is recent and not older than six months. So this is the recommendation and the reason why it should not be older than six months or it's not advised to be older than six months is because changes in the patient's oral environment could take place and render the treatment planning process inaccurate. Remember that the oral cavity is a very dynamic environment and a lot of changes can really happen very, very quickly. So what we need to have is we need to have the most recent CBCT so that really accurately represents what is happening in the patient's mouth at the moment. Field of view. Now, in the picture that we have in front of us, we have multiple sizes of CBCTs. So which one is really the one that you need to use for guided surgery? Number A is a full face CBCT. B is a full maxilla and mandible CBCT, so it's a dual R CBCT. 
C is a quadrant CBCT and D is a full arch mandible at CBCT. Well, if you are planning on doing guided surgery, the minimum requirement will be D. So ideally what we need to have is we need to have all the structures visible in the arch that we're going to be placing the implants in. That includes the nerve canal, mental foramen, the other side of the teeth because we're going to be using that for matching and I'll talk more about this later on. If you're going to be doing freehand surgery, C is definitely enough. If you're going to be doing a full upper and lower uh, implant placement, number B is what you need. And number A, we don't really need it for only guided surgery purposes. We need it for maybe a digital oral design, which is another topic we've spoken about in a previous episode and a previous video. So in essence, for guided surgery, what do you need? You need a CBCT that basically captures all the different anatomical structures in the arch that you're going to be placing the implants in. And we definitely do not recommend using a quadrant CBCT for guided surgery. What about motion artifacts? What are motion artifacts? Remember that when we take the CBCT, it actually takes quite some time for the CBCT image to be acquired. In that time, during the acquisition, the patient might move slightly and that results in what we call motion artifacts. So if you have motion artifacts, ideally do not use that CBCT and take another CBCT that has no motion artifact in it. So where do you exactly check for a motion artifact? In some cases, it's quite obvious. So you can see here that there's doubling in the teeth. In some cases, in the mandible, for instance, what I recommend is looking at the buccal side of the mandible and where right now you can see a doubling of the cortical plate of the body of the mandible. And this is how you know that this is a motion artifact. What about the maxilla? In the maxilla, you usually look also for cortical plates. So, for instance, look at the anterior wall of the sinus, the posterior wall of the sinus and the floor of the sinus as well. If you have this doubling, it means that this is an image with uh, motion artifacts and it's not recommended to use this image. Again, also in the teeth, it might look something like this. So make sure that you check the CBCT before your patient leaves the office and make sure that it's free of motion. Again, you would like to have the most accurate treatment planning and that is only possible if you have a CBCT that is free of motion artifacts. Uh, number four would be a uh, metal scatter or artifacts. So metal scatter is basically this artifact that we see right here when our patients have metal into their mouths. So what happens is when the beams of the x-ray hit a very dense structure, it causes these artifacts or the scattering artifacts, and it really causes our image not to look very pretty, as you can see here, and it really reduces the quality, the information that we can gather out of the CBCT. More recent CBCT scanning machines have what we call noise reduction technology or scatter reduction technology or scatter reduction algorithms. So they move images from being, you know, these images like this image on the left side to a slightly better image, which is the image on the right side. So we need to really be aware of these artifacts, these scatter artifacts. And in my presentation today, I'll talk to you about novel approaches and methods that we have in order for us to overcome these images and still be able to treatment plan and match uh, our case. So this is how metal scatter usually looks like and all of us are pretty much familiar with this and again we'll talk about this in more detail today. Uh, last thing I would like to speak to you about is beam hardening effect and beam hardening effect is a very important artifact that we need to know about. I can't tell you how many implants have been falsely extracted because people don't really know much about beam hardening. So what is beam hardening? Well, beam hardening just in essence is if we have a very dense object in the CBCT, what we will find is that you will find dark streaks or dark lines around this very dense object. And this is what we call beam hardening effect. And you can see it from this image right here. And this is how originally the image should look like. Same thing here. These are the uh, beam hardening effect. Same thing here and same thing here as well. So how does that really affect us 
in implantology and how does that relate to implants? Well, let's take a look at the image on the left side. The two posterior implants, if you look at between the two implants, you'll find that it's, you know, quite pitch black. It's black, you know, usually if someone does not have a lot of experience or does not know what beam hardening effect is, you'll essentially say that I can see that there's a lot of bone loss between the two implants. But if we take a periapical x-ray of the same case and the same patient, and you'll find that right now in between the implants, you know, obviously there is no loss of bone whatsoever. In this case and what that tells you is in order for us to follow up on implants it's always advised to follow up on implants using periapical x-ray rather than CBCTs due to the fact that we might have what we call the beam hardening effect so if you ever see a CBCT that looks like this and you're wondering if there's any sort of bone loss around your implant always verify using a periapical x-ray what about model scans well, do model scans have criteria as well? Absolutely. So let's talk about the criteria for models as well. Models could be acquired by one of two ways. Number one, either completely digital from the beginning by taking an intraodal scan or physically using an impression. So what we could do is we could just scan the impression or pour the impression and then scan the model. But there are certain things that we always need to check in the models or the impressions before sending them out to do a guided surgery. Number one, impressions should register as much soft tissue as possible for guide support. Surgical guides do not only rest on teeth. Remember, they sit on teeth and tissue. So even though this intraoral scan looks good, but if I tell you the treatment plan, the treatment plan in this case is to place an implant at site number 16 and site number 17. So you can see right now from this intraoral scan that there isn't much soft tissue that was actually scanned in order for us to be able to plan and in order for us to be able to design a surgical guide to seat in this area. So again, remember that the surgical guide seats on teeth and tissue not only teeth. So always the recommendation is to cover and register as much soft tissue as possible, whether you were taking an intraoral scan or if you were taking an impression. Make sure there are no bubbles in the impressions and there are no distortions. The reason why is because these bubbles could interfere with the seating of the surgical guide in the patient's mouth eventually. High quality impressions are required. The quality of the guide is of the quality of the model, just like any other dental procedure. Now let's move on to talking about the type of cases and how we can manage each case and each type of case that you get. So we have two different types of cases. We have partially edentulous cases and we have fully edentulous cases. And in the presentation today, we'll learn about the differences between the protocols for doing guided surgery for a partially edentulous case and for a fully edentulous case. First, let's talk about the partially edentulous cases. Partially edentulous cases, a protocol is actually quite simple. The idea is I take the CBCT and I take the model of the patient and in the R2Gate software, what we do is we try to match three points or to find three common points in order for us to be able to match the model to the CBCT. And again, it's a very easy process and this is how we can merge the model to the CBCT. After we do that, we start to do our treatment planning and our treatment planning is based on two main things. Number one is the restorative position because remember, patients want teeth and not implants. Number two will be the availability of bone and soft tissues as well. This is usually the workflow that we do in R2Gate. What we do is what we call the top-down treatment planning concept. So number one, we go for the merging. So we get the CBCT, we match that to the model. And then we design the prosthetics. So we always, always plan the prosthetics before we place the implant. So this is a fully digital wax up. And then based on the position of the teeth and the digital wax up, the final step would be to treatment plan 
the implants. And again, this is what we call the restoratively driven planning. Remember what we said at the beginning, guided prosthetics is the key. Now, for partially edentulous cases, the reason why it's a simpler protocol, the reason why is because in the CBCT and the STO file, we can see the teeth. So I can see the teeth in the CBCT, and I can see the teeth in the STL file, and because I can see both, now I have common or reference points that eventually allows me to merge or to match all the data together. But in some cases where the teeth are not clear, like if we have metal artifacts, for instance, that cause the image not to be very clear, how can we really manage these cases and how can we accurately match our data together? For that, we actually came up with quite a new solution. So what we're using is what we call the R2 tray. And the R2 tray is basically a radio pick tray that we have the patient wear while the patient is being CBCT scanned. So how do we really use and prepare the R2 gate uh, tray? So in essence, what we say is in cases like these where you have a lot of natural teeth, there is no need for you to use an R2 tray. Just go ahead and scan the patient since you already know that you can see the teeth quite clearly and there's no metal in the patient's mouth. On the other hand, in some cases, we have a lot of metal in the patient's mouth. We have a lot of crowns, a lot of fillings. These are the cases where we advise that you use the R2 tray. The reason why is because these cases emit a lot of scatter, and then eventually it's going to be very tough for us to actually match everything together. So the R2 tray is a short tray that we can place in the patient's mouth right here in the video. You see that we're trying to fit of the tray in the patient's mouth just to make sure that it fits in the patient's mouth. Like any other tray, just apply a little bit of adhesive in the tray. And then what we recommend is using a polyvinyl siloxane or PVS rubber base or bite registration material into the fitting surface of the tray and then just go ahead and place that in the patient's mouth. Right here, you'll see that we're placing the tray in the patient's mouth all the way down until it actually fully seats in the patient's mouth. What we'll do right now is we'll wait for that material to set without any movement. And then after that, I'll go ahead and I'll take it out of the patient's mouth. Right here, the tray was taken out of the patient's mouth. And we're just trying the fit of the tray again, just to make sure that there are no rocking movement that happens in the patient's mouth right here. Next will be to CVCT scan the patient wearing the tray. So see here, this is a case that has a lot of scatter in it. You know, these are one of those very difficult cases to match. See here how much scatter we have. But due to the fact that we used an R2 tray in this case, you see here, I can see the outline of the tray. And because I can see the outline of the tray, this is what really enables me to do the matching between the model and the CBCT. So you see here how the R2 tray actually helps us in this process. And due to the, to the fact that it has a flat, nice outline that enables us to confirm the accuracy of the matching as much as possible. And this is what we need in guided surgery. The accuracy of the matching really, really makes a big difference when it comes to the accuracy of the placement of the implant. The final implant position is you know, tremendously affected by the accuracy of the match. So in essence, when and when not to use an R2 tray. So in natural teeth, where cases like this, where you have a lot of natural teeth, you don't need to use an R2 tray. On the other hand, if we have cases like this, where we have a lot of metal scatter, it's always advised to use the R2 tray. Now, what about fully edentulous cases? Can we use the standard R2 tray in these cases? Well, let's talk about this in more detail. Fully edentulous cases, the challenge in fully edentulous cases is that there is really no reference for the matching between the CBCT and the STL file or the model of the patient. You see here, the CBCT only allows us to see the bone of the patient. On the other hand, the impression that we have only shows the soft tissue of the patient. So how would we be able to match 
the model to the CBCT scan in this case. And that's why we need to know a little bit more about the fully edentulous protocol for the matching. So I would like to divide fully edentulous cases into two different sections. Number one will be patients who don't have dentures or with bad dentures. These basically fall into the categories of patients that don't have dentures. And we have patients who do have good dentures, and by good dentures we mean they fit good, the aesthetics are good, phonetics, and they function really well. So these are the two different methods, or these are the two different categories for fully edentulous cases. And let's see how we manage each one of those cases. So patients who don't have dentures or with bad dentures. Let's talk about this first. Patients who don't have dentures, the way we manage these cases is we always start with an impression. So in this case, I took impressions. And then the next step, what I will do is I will make what we call a special or an individual R2 tray. If you remember, just a few moments ago, we talked about the R2 tray. And the main feature of the R2 tray was that the R2 tray is a radio opaque tray which means that it shows in the CBCT. And this is actually what we want. The idea here is the standard R2 tray will not fit in a fully edentulous patient's mouth. We need to fabricate a special R2 tray. In order for us to do that, what we use is we use triad, a certain type of triad, which is actually radio pink. So you see here, this is how we make a standard special tray for the patient, just like we usually do special trays for impressions. So this special tray was made with this special radiopaque triad and on top of that what we do is we put a layer of wax and this looks like a bite block. And then this is the workflow for fully edentulous cases. Again the models, resin basing, build up of a wax worm, try in and then we CBCT scan the patient wearing that bite block. Let's talk a little bit more about the try-in or what we do actually in the patient's mouth in order for us to be able to do our guided surgery. So in the try-in, what we do is this. What you need to check is you need to check that we have good labial fullness. We have the correct vertical dimension of occlusion. We have the patient's centric relation and we mark the midline and we also mark the canine line. Just like we do in a normal bite registration process when we're fabricating indenture. Now the next step will be for me to send the R2 tray of the patient to the lab. And then what the lab does is that they scan this R2 tray. And I also CBCT scan the patient wearing the tray. And now in the CBCT that was taken with the special tray, you'll find right now I can actually see the base of the tray which is the radiopaque resin. And since I can see that, the next step will be for me to match the CBCT to the scan of the special R2 tray. So right here, you see that through the base of the tray, I was able to find matching points and I was able to merge the SDL file of the tray to the CBCT file of the patient wearing the tray. Now, if you want to see this process in more detail, this is just a, a, a video recording of the R2Gate software. And what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to find the threshold that shows me that uh, tray. And since I can see the tray right now, this is the SDL file of the tray. And what I will do right now is I'll import the tray scan. And now what I will do is I'll go ahead and I'll find matching points between the tray and the CBCT. What I will use is I will use the top part, which is basically the resin part. I'm not going to use the bottom because the bottom is wax. I'll place one point in the center, one point on the left side, and a third point on the right side. And then I'll merge my data together. And essentially, this is what I get. From the matching, I get the tray to match really well to my CBCT scan. And this is basically how we match a model to a CBCT scan for a patient that does not have a denture. This is how the base of the tray looks like in a CBCT. Again, since it's a radiopaque tray, I could see it really clearly. And right here is the wax rim. 
Now that I've matched the CBCT to the SDL file through my merging process, I will use the orientation lines or the reference lines for the midline, the canine lines, and through these, I'll go ahead and I'll design a digital wax up. My digital wax up will eventually help me know exactly where I'm going to be placing my implant. So again, just refer back to what we said at the beginning. We always want to plan the implants based on the position of the teeth. We would like everything to be prosthetically driven. What about patients that have dentures, that are good dentures, they fit well, they look good, and the phonetics and functions are actually adequate. In these cases, do I really need to do all that previous workflow? And the answer is no. So let me go ahead and show you three alternative options for patients that already do have good dentures. Option number one, dual scan protocol using composite markers. So, this is a denture that I have for my patient. This is the good denture that the patient has. And essentially, all I've done was I've just added a few dots of flowable composite. I add about three to four dots on the buccal side and three to four on the lingual side. The next step will be for me to scan the denture using an intraoral scanner or a lab scanner. And this is the uh, SDL file that results out of the intraoral scan or the model scan, or in some cases, even a CBCT, and then I SDLize the CBCT and I get an SDL file out of it. This is how the upper model looks like as well. This is the intraoral scan of the upper model. Again, you could do that with a model scanner. You could do that with a CBCT if you can export an SDL file from the CBCT. Next step will be for me to CBCT scan the patient wearing the denture. So here I have these composite dots and based on these composite dots, I was actually able to merge the uh, denture of the patient to the CBCT. See here where I have the upper and lower models, I was able to uh, put that in the scan because I was able to match everything together through the uh, uh, composite dots. And then lastly, what we do is we just clip the inside of the denture and we use that as a model. Option number two will be to duplicate the patient's existing denture with radiopaque material like barium sulfate. In this case, the patient already has a denture. So what we did was we took a copy and we made a copy of this denture and we produced it with a little bit of barium sulfate. The reason why we did this, just to make sure that we could see the denture in the CBCT, as you can see here, I can see really clearly. And the teeth in the denture will help us go ahead and plan the implants based on their position. So that's essentially the second option for us to match a, a fully edentulous case for a patient that already has a denture. Option number three would be using a radiopaque polyvinyl siloxane or a radiopaque spray. So in some cases, if we're using a type of radiopaque uh, PVS or a rubber-based impression material, what we could do is we can reline the patient's existing denture with uh, polyvinyl siloxane. Or in some cases, if we have a radiopaque spray, like in this case, for instance, this is one of my cases, you could just simply spray inside the patient's uh, denture and through that you'll be able to identify the fitting surface. For you to see how that looks like, again, in this case, we use actually a combination of both. So you see here this small white line. This line here is actually what enables us to be able to identify where uh, the model outline is. So this is how we use a radiopaque reline material or how we use a spray, radiopaque spray, or a combination of so now we've covered all scanning protocols for fully edentulous patients. Now let's talk about the main challenges that we face with fully guided surgery protocols. First challenge would be how do we design the provisionals before the surgery with open third-party software? Number two, 
is how do we place the implants exactly as planned in terms of the depth of the implant and also the indexing or the hex of the implant. Let me show you how we could do that with the R2Gate protocol. Number one, how do we design the provisionals before the surgery with open third-party softwares? Well, in the R2Gate software, when you're treatment planning your implant, you have the option to export a lot of different types of abutments from the software. These different types of abutments could be either a scan abutment, and you could use that scan abutment and model in order for you to be able to design the crown before the surgery. Number two, you can also export a stuck abutment from the R2Gate software, and you could also export a multi-unit abutment. And that allows you to design the prosthesis before the surgery. Now, challenge number two would be how do we place implants exactly as planned in terms of the implant depth and the indexing. And I'll tell you how we could do that through a special implant carrier and a special window in the surgical guide design. When you're placing your implant through the surgical guide, we have two rules that you need to apply. Rule number one, during placing the implant through the surgical guide, I need to make sure that this horizontal marking right here, the silver mark, if it coincides with the top of the surgical guide, it means that this implant has been placed to the correct depth. On the other hand, if the green markings in the carrier show through the built-in window in the surgical guide, it means that this is also the flat side of the hex. So right now, with R2Gate, I can place the implant to the correct depth that I plant for, and also with the correct hex position as well. In this video, we're going to be using our surgical guide for drilling. So right now, I'm drilling directly through my surgical guide. And now when it comes to the implant placement, I'm now placing my implant through the surgical guide. I prefer to place the implants first by hand, and then I place the implants with the handpiece. When you're placing the implant with the handpiece, always stop about a millimeter to two millimeters before the final depth. Then, start to use your torque ratchet, and bear in mind that the first rule that we need to apply would be the vertical position or the depth of the implant. And right now, this will be the proper depth of the implant that I plan for. But what about the hex position of the implant? Is this the correct hex position that I plan for? No. In order for me to place the implant with the same hex position that I plan for, I could just torque the implant down a little bit more until the green shows through the built-in window in the surgical guide. Right now, I have applied both rules, the apical coronal position, the depth of the implant, and the hex position as well. And this is how you place the implant with the most accuracy exactly as you planned it. The R2 gate surgical guide design is quite simple. It does not use sleeves and it does not use spoons. The reason why is because of the special design of the drills. The drills of the R2 gate surgical kits are composed of two parts. Number one will be the guide part and number two will be the drilling part. The guide part is a smooth part, and this is the part that engages the surgical guide, so there is no danger when it engages the surgical guide. Also, it has been proven in the literature that using surgical guides without metal sleeves that are completely 3D printed actually reduces the lateral movements of the drills. So by using 3D printing with reduced sleeve diameter, that actually reduces the amount of wiggle and the amount of deviation that happens with the drills. Also, this is a more specific study that compared the R2Gate uh, software and the R2Gate surgical guides with other uh, different brands of surgical guides like the Simplant and the Nobel guide and other types of surgical guides. And what we found was that the tolerance of the R2Gate surgical guides were actually significantly smaller than the others. The main reason behind the accuracy of the R2Gate surgical guides is actually the finishing protocol. 
So with the R2 gate surgical guides, in the finishing protocol, what we do is after 3D printing the surgical guides, we don't only rely on the accuracy of the 3D printer, which actually varies from a manufacturer to another. What we do is to make sure that the inside of the surgical guide and the sleeve diameter is exactly five millimeters, we use what we call the finishing precision tools. By using these tools and passing them through the surgical guide, we make sure that the inside of the surgical guide is exactly the same diameter as the drills, which means that there is no wiggle space and no room for the drills to move and deviate. Now let's talk about the R2Gate surgical kit contents and usage and talk about the R2Gate report and drilling sequence. The R2Gate system offers you two types of surgical kits. Number one will be the universal type of kit. And what the universal type of kit is, it's essentially a kit that contains drills only up to 2.8 millimeter diameter. So you have the initial and a second drill, 2.0 millimeter drills, 2.5 millimeter drills, and 2.8 millimeter drills. For this kit, Disposable drills can be added in order for you to complete the kit. When you add these disposable drills, you can eventually get your kit to look like this, and this is more a complete type of kit. The reason why we have this type of kit is because it's a cheaper solution than a full surgical kit. The other option is a full kit. And a full kit is what we have in front of us right now, and these are the components of the full surgical kit. The initial drill, second drill, guided drills, cortical bone drills, profiler drills, implant carriers, handpiece adapter, ratchet extender, screwdrivers, and a ratchet. The initial drill is what we call the marking drill. It's a very short drill that is used to only mark the position of the osteotomy and then we use it to guide the other drills and the subsequent drills to go in the correct position. The second drill has the same tip as the initial drill but on top of it, it has this part right here that profiles the cortical bone and it enables you to place the next universal drills very smooth. There is also the cortical bone drills and these are drills that remove the cortical bone and you'll find that their names are 3405, 3805. 34 is basically the diameter so it means that the diameter is 3.4 and 05 means that the length of them is 5 millimeters. So in this case for instance this is a 3805 drill, which means that this is a 3.8 cortical bone drill and the length of this drill is 5 millimeters. Please notice that all cortical bone drills are only 5 millimeters in length. Next would be the bone profiler. The bone profiler is a cup shaped drill and it enables you to remove all the bone interferences on top of the implant for you to be able to place your abutment with ease, whether it was a healing abutment or a final abutment. And now we'll talk about the optional drills. First optional drill is the narrow crest drill. The narrow crest drill is a drill that you usually purchase separately and add into your surgical kit. And what it does is that it transforms cases that have knife edge ridges, like in this case, and it transforms them into a more flat type of bone, and that prevents your drills from slipping on the top of the ridge. It looks like a trefined burr, but the function of it is to flatten the bone so you can easily place your next drills and use them smoothly. Now let's talk about the basic principles of R2 gate drill. Number one, make sure that the cylinder part of the drill, which is this part right here, engages the surgical guide before you press on the pedal 
and start to use the surgical drills. Number two, make sure that the drilling is passive and make sure that a copious amount of irrigation is going to the drills. I always use the high setting of irrigation just to reduce the amount of heat and friction that might be generated while I'm doing my drilling. The basic drilling steps for the R2Gate surgical kit is that we increase the length first and then we increase the diameter. So for instance, if I'm going to be placing an 11.5 millimeter implant and let's say my final drill is a 2.8. First, I'll use the initial drill and then I'll use my second drill and then I'll start to increase the length and go to the final length. So I'll go with 2.0 by 7, 2.0 by 8.5, 2.0 by 10, 2.0 by 11.5. And once I reach the final depth, I can go ahead and start to increase the diameter. So then I'll use 2.5 by 11.5 and then 2.8 by 11.5 will be my final drill. Please note that the drills from 2.0 to 4.3, the cylinder or the hub of the drills is five millimeters in diameter. While from 4.8 to 5.9 millimeter drills, the hub or the diameter of the drills is actually 6.5 millimeters. So knowing this information, and the question is for Megagen AnyRidge users, what would be the largest diameter AnyRidge implant that you can place through the regular platform five millimeter surgical guide? Well, the answer is 4.5. The reason why is because with the AnyRidge implants, the widest thread diameter is 0.5 millimeter wider than the fixture at 3.5 and 0.4 millimeter wider than the fixture itself at 4.0 to 8 millimeter. So for example, the 3.5 millimeter implant, the widest diameter is actually 4. On the other hand, the 4.0 millimeter diameter all the way up to the 8.0 millimeter implants the fixture diameter is plus 0.4. So 4.5 millimeter implant is actually 4.9, and that will be the widest implant that could be placed through the surgical guide. Also knowing this information, what will be the largest diameter any rigid implant that can be placed through the 6.5 millimeter wide platform guide? Again, the answer is 6 millimeters. So 6 millimeter any ridge implant is actually 6.4 and that will be the widest implant that could be placed through a wide platform surgical guide. So in essence, the largest implant that can be placed through an R2Gate guide is actually 6 millimeters. 5.0, 5.5 and 6.0 millimeter implant, you will need two guides to place your implant. The first guide, which is the regular platform, will be used for drilling, and a wide platform guide will be used for implant placement. The diameter of the cylinder of the surgical guide drills are either 5 millimeters or 6.5. So what do we do with cases where we have less than 5 millimeters of mesodistal space? Can I use the standard surgical kit? And the answer is no. For this, we made a solution called the R2Gate Narrow Kit. So the R2Gate Narrow Kit is a surgical kit that is composed of three different sizes of drills. Number one would be the 1.8 millimeter, 2.5, and 2.8. We use this kit in cases we have less than five millimeters of mesodistal space. The reason why is because the narrow surgical kit has a diameter of 3.5 millimeters, while a regular stent has a diameter of 5 millimeters. Last but not least will be the anchor pin kit. R2Gate offers a full anchor pin kit that is composed of a driver, what we call a stent anchor, and nine different anchor pins. 
So the anchor pins are a threaded type of anchor pins and we do not need to use drills to place the anchor pins in position. They're usually placed with the driver. The stent anchors are abutments that are used to stabilize the guide by means of insertion into already placed implants. The anchor pins come in three different lengths, three out of each length, five millimeter, 7.5, 10 millimeter. The five millimeter anchor pin has one stripe. The 7.5 millimeter has two stripes. The 10 millimeter has three stripes. This is a video that shows how to use the anchor pins. As you can see here, we are inserting the anchor pins using the driver. We do not need to use drills for this type of anchor pin. Now this is another video that shows how we use the stent anchors. So we use the stent anchors after we place implants. So here in the video, I'll place an implant through the surgical guide. After the final placement, of the implant into the surgical guide, I can place the stent anchor through my surgical guide to insert in the implant that has already been placed and that increases the stability of my surgical guide. Now let's talk about the R2 gate report and drilling sequence. With each R2 gate case you do with your R2 gate center, they should send you an R2 gate 3D diagnostic report. And now I'll talk to you about how we can read and use the R2 report. In the R2 report, at the top, you'll find information about the patient. You'll find information about the operation site. You'll find information about your name as a dentist. You'll also find information about the type of restoration that is going to be delivered in case you do one day implants and who is the designer and who is the person that did the planning and the design of the surgical guide and the restoration for your case. You'll also find information about the site of the implant that is going to be placed, the type of implant that is going to be placed and also the size of the implant. In this case, we're placing a 4.0 millimeter implant by 8.5. The bone density information in the site based on the bone density analysis that is done using the digital eye shows that this is a D3 type of bone. Also in the report, you'll find number one, a 3D view image. Number two, a cross-sectional image and an image with digital eye. You'll also find information about the drilling protocol. So in this case, for instance, we're going to be drilling using the initial and second drill, the 2.0, 2.5, 3.3 millimeter implant, and then cortical bone drill 3805. You'll also find markings. Some of these markings look like a circle. Some others look like half a circle, and some look like an exclamation mark. A full circle means full depth drilling. That means that I will take my drill and I'll go all the way down to the end of my osteotomy until my drill stopper touches the surgical guide and it stops in the guide. Half depth drilling means if I'm using an implant that is shorter than 10 millimeters, the recommendation is to use that short cortical bone drill, which is only five millimeters all the way down. If I'm using an implant that is 10 millimeters or longer, it is recommended to use the 7 millimeter drill and go all the way down until the end of the osteotomy. Exclamation mark means that this drill is optional. So based on what you see at the time of the surgery and your clinical sense, then it will be advised to use or not to use that particular drill. Now let's talk about the clinical application of R2 gate and how do we use the surgical guide. This is a video that shows a surgery that we have done for one of our patients. And in this case, we're going to be doing an immediate placement for sites number 11 and site number 21. We'll start this case by extracting tooth number 21 and tooth number 11. These teeth were deemed 
uh, unsalvageable and we had to extract these teeth and the option was and the treatment plan was to place two implants and do immediate uh, loading for this case. After the extraction what we'll do is we'll do debridement and we'll make sure that we remove all the granulation tissue and all the periodontal ligament in the sockets. This is how the site looks like after the extraction. Now I'll place my R2 gate surgical guide in position. I'll make sure that it seats and I'll always start with my initial or marking drill as we previously mentioned. After the initial drill we'll use the second drill and then I'll start to use my standard drills and I'll start with the shortest and the narrowest drill which is 2.0 by 7 and then I'll go and I'll increase the length to 8.5 then 10 millimeters and then I'll increase the final length to 13 millimeters which is the final length. After reaching the final length I'll start to increase the diameter so I'll start with 2.5 2.8 millimeters by 13 and then I'll use my 3.3 by 8.5 to do what we call a segmental or step back osteotomy. Sometimes I like to finish with using the second drill just to remove any cortical bone around the neck of the implant. I start by placing my implant by hand. This is a 3.5 by 13 millimeter implant and then I'll drive my implant uh, by using the handpiece. Now using my indexing system I'll make sure that I place the green part of the implant carrier to show through the window of the surgical guide as what we have in front of us in the screen. I'll then place my smart pegs to measure ISQ. I'll take measurements on the buckle side and on the palatal side as well. Here I got 63 and 70 for my implant. And now I'll move on to start drilling for my other implant. I'll do the same workflow. I'll make sure that I start drilling with the initial, then second drill. And then I start to increase the length of my osteotomy incrementally by starting with the narrowest, shortest drill, and then I'll work my way up to the longest drill. Here, my final drill is going to be 13 millimeters in length. After I reach 13 millimeters, I can start to increase the diameter of the, of the drill. So I'll go with 2.5 by 13 millimeter, 2.8 by 13 millimeter, and now the final drill will be 3.3 by 8.5 millimeters. And then again, I use the second drill to remove any bone that is around the neck of the implant. I'll place my other implant, which is also a 3.5 by 13 millimeter. Drive the implant with the handpiece and stop about a millimeter to two millimeters short to the final depth. Once I do that, I can use my torque ratchet to place my implant with the hex side facing buckle. And now, as you can see here, I have both sites with the green in the right spot. I'll measure ISQ for my second implant. In this case, we got 77 ISQ on both buckle and lingual sides. I'll go ahead and remove my uh, smart peg. And now I'll start to close the openings of my implants, close the connection so I can go ahead and I'll place and pack bone with the, in the jumping gap between the implant and the wall of the socket. And it was always recommended to do that just to make sure that we preserve the volume of the tissues. I'll pack my bone really nice in position. And make sure that this bone is nicely compacted. After I do that, I can go ahead and remove the cover screw from my implant. And then I'll place the final abutment. In this case, this is a zirconia custom abutment. This is going to be a one abutment, one type, a one, uh, one time type of protocol. And as you can see here, again, the reason why we did this at cement retain because the implants obviously are coming out through the incisal edge of the tooth so just to make sure that we could do this and it's a nice aesthetic uh, result we need to make sure that we do this with a cement retained type of restoration. I'll seal the openings of the screw channel
using Flowable Composite. Like Cure That. And I'll make sure that I adjust any context that needs to be adjusted. Remember, with the guided surgery, there might be a little bit of deviation. So for me to overcome the issue of deviation, I could just adjust the crowns a little bit. And this is going to be my final result. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I hope the presentation today was informative enough. Uh, we tried to make sure that we incorporate as much information about the R2Gate system here for you today. And we really talked about everything that you might need to get started with your first case. I was very pleased to introduce the R2Gate system to you. Again, my name is Dr. Sam Omar. This is my email. In case you have any questions, please don't hesitate to talk to me, send me an email, and I'll be more than happy to answer your question. Last but not least, I'd like to give a very, very special thanks to my dear mentor, Dr. JC Kim, who's the inventor and the father of the R2Gate system and the digital oral design. Dr. Kim, thank you so much. And everybody, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to my lecture. Have a good day.